development background. And so for the past few years, I've been looking at extracting workflow data from ticketing systems to gain insights into how organizations interact with work. And I've been using those insights to both reflect status um, across teams and projects, help organizations predict um, completion dates for projects, and capacity plan quarter over quarter. And uh, recently, I've been looking at uh, using that data to uh, both budget um, very early in the project cycle, and also track costs, uh, the burn rate for costs as projects are progressing. So like most of my presentations, this is sort of just a snapshot of where I'm at with that kind of work. Um, having been through several organizations, I generally find that there are three systems for tracking projects. There's um, uh, Clarity or some kind of hour tracking system. There's Jira or some kind of ticketing system for managing scope. And there's some sort of par process where people go to beg for money to get things done. Um, the least defined of all of them. For our purposes, we're gonna focus in on um, Jira for the scope and clarity for the cost. Uh, each system is kind of in a, in a dichotomy relationship where we have scope without costs, and we have costs without scope. And it's all dependent on developers bridging that somehow, honestly. <laughs> so, um, this is developers doing work at, uh, in an organization that might be using some of the stuff that we just learned about where we have issues over epics, managing initiatives or programs or something along of that nature. And if an organization is smart enough to try to connect one to one, the money they got with a ticket in JIRA that represents all the work necessary to get that out, they're in a good position to be able to start rolling up costing in JIRA. So let's take a look at developers entering time. This is basically, it's a very lonely situation sitting at your desk as a developer, trying to remember what you did and plug in those hours in the costing system that doesn't exactly match the language in JIRA or anywhere else in the organization. Um, so they might put five, in, five hours in for project one, 20 for two, 15 for three, if, if they're interested in actually breaking it out like that. I never was. Um, so we could look in JIRA. So the thing about developers is that if they have good JIRA hygiene, if an organization really engages with JIRA in basically an honest way, um, we know what a developer was working on when, because we know the width states for that story. And a basic calculation we could run is, hey, how much does a developer cost per day, and how many days did they spend on that story? And we come up with a calculation that would be the cost for that story. So that's great, except developers might have multiple stories in flight at any given time, and so you need to serialize the developer's fixed cost per day across the stories they have as width for any given day. And so here you might look at this center line, right, or I haven't got the pointer, but you look at the center line, there's three things in process on that day. So how do we serialize a developer's time? And this is the edge of where I'm at. This is the stuff I'm working on right now, but I like coming up with simple formulas that kind of mimic the way people just think, because if you look at how people think, they're not that complicated. They use basically simple formulas to figure out how to, how to resolve issues like this. So we might go, um, the formula we're gonna use is uh, starting a story trumps continuing a story, because there was an action by the developer. You assume if they drag it in process, but they've already got some whip, they're likely working on that story. Um, finishing trumps continuing. If they close a story out, it's likely that they did some work on that to make that happen, um, even if they have work in process. And starting trumps finishing, because I think it's more likely that a story was hanging out and they just closed it right then and then started a story. Um, your results may vary, so figure out what your developers do and try to encode it and then try to get people to follow those behaviors. There's a little bit of behavior modification here as well. So if we do that, then we have a serialized view of what the developer was working on when by project if you've got it structured in a way like you just saw. So this is, uh, I'm like an OG nerd, so my tooling is very uh, text heavy and basic, but this is, one of the, this is where I'm at with the algorithms that I've been working on. So I can extract workflow data from Jira, 
I can run a query which is uh, ls recursively of all the type scope and pipe it to the cost command, and it'll break out for all of the scope returned by that query, which is for delivery 140, which is basically an initiative, which you guys just heard about. So there's lots of epics and lots of teams involved, and it'll start breaking it out. It says it's using a daily rate of 720. We know that in JIRA, there's 269 stories. We know that of those stories, 198 are done. We know that there's 71 of them are still to do on this project. And I've also got my predictive metrics in there, which is predicting that there's gonna be 17 additional stories that the teams are likely to create based on how they break down work historically. Then we estimate the total scope, which is predicted future plus the stuff we know about, and we think there's gonna be 286 stories by the end of this project. The average cycle time for a story is five, we start looking at the rate times the cycle time, that's the cost per story for this project, and then we can say, okay, we've got sunk costs of about $700,000, that's the scope we've done. We've got known future costs, the scope we know about, of about $250,000, and we're predicting about an additional 61,000 that isn't even in Jira yet. And from there, we can go uh, combine future costs, 316, and then the estimated total project, project cost is about a million dollars. And we can run this, whenever we want. So we can, we can create a flow of understanding how our burn rate is going with this kind of tool. And this is where we, so this is um, a chart that I have from another presentation. I just threw it in there because you guys did an initiatives presentation. So this chart would show a swim lane for each initiative you're working on, the backlog for that initiative over time. So the top one is showing um, at April, they started an initiative, they completed it sometime in October, and that's, that was what was in the to-do column. So it's cumulative flow just at the to-do column. And you can see that the, the, the um, scope spiked up and then it burned out and they completed the project. Well, throughout that time that you're running that project, you can be running these costing, and you, you should hit an inflection point at the middle where you've completed half your scope and you've burned through half your money. And if halfway through the project that's not true, you get to make some decisions early, right? Um, about the amount of scope, about the amount of capacity you have allocated to it, those kinds of things. So a lot of what I'm doing is using workflow data to move decisions as early in the cycle as possible, using some data to facilitate the conversations. Um, another thing that I can do is break the costs out by developer. So I've erased the names. This is actual data, but I've blown the names out. Um, I can extract the names as well, but we can see uh, developer number one uh, has 121 days of cycle time on this project across 14 stories, and I have two different costing formulas I'm playing with. Um, the one on the left is the, is the real one. That's the winner. Um, but it'll tell you basically the cost sunk by developer. Um, you can do those kinds of things as well. So the other thing you can do is start to develop a language of cost within the organization. You know your average story cost. If you have a story, it's gonna cost you about $3,000 to get it out. You can start thinking in those terms. If you have an epic, it's gonna cost you about $30,000 to get it out. And if you've got an initiative, maybe $300,000. You can start to figure out basically what things look like based on the sizes that they are this, um, with, with the issues and epics and so forth associated with it. And just looking at a project, you get a ballpark figure in your head. So this is some correlations I've done between Clarity and Jira. So using the costing formula I just showed you, um, we've got what uh, Jira in gray predicts or believes that the project cost and what Clarity believes it costs. And you can see there's a correlation there, right? Stronger on some projects, not on others. There are some issues with projects that are older that, have, that people have cannibalized the stories out of them and so forth, so the data becomes less um, accurate. And this is the cost per story um, based on some calculations, uh, data added clarity, data added Jira. Still, there's some correlation there. It's promising, right? So why might that be true? And I think this is why. Because when a developer is looking at clarity, they're going, hmm, what was I doing? And they're thinking about Jira, right? So project one, yeah, I closed that ticket. Project two, I closed that ticket. I think Jira is really the base uh, reality of what developers think about when they're reporting into Clarity, and Clarity is this real pain in the butt that they just want to get done with, so 
JIRA is actually the more accurate measure of what projects are costing, which is lucky because there's a lot of things you can do with that data to then estimate future costs. That's it. Thank you. Is that, uh, I've heard of Tempo, is it like a clarity system, or is it? It's, it's Jira-centric, yep. um, and it does a lot of, it does budgeting, time sheet, uh, such, yep. so that you can pull the costing data right out of here. It's all in. Yeah, anything that requires someone to enter a number, I'm trying to eliminate. Ah. Yep. Anything else? So, here, so, right so right essentially here. deriving how much time was spent on the story by just looking at whether the thing got closed, the thing got started, Etc. Right? I think so. Easy. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Those are the correlation. The correlation was at the beginning. Yep. The rules. Okay. Yep. Well, well, speaking to just kind of piggybacking on that, uh, speaking to somebody who keeps a lot of tickets open all the time, um, <laughs> one of the things is, is you know, perhaps we could have additional um, inflection points by adding, like, when somebody's adding comments, adding labels, you know, basically yeah. activity with the ticket. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So you can also potentially look at code check-ins. Yes. Really do introspection on that ticket and figure out what the what the important data is. I haven't, I haven't pushed it there yet, but yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to uh, ask if you had any experience using sort of full slice tickets that, that have QA involved or UX involved, so that if people are sharing tickets, maybe they're not sharing tasks, but they're sharing tickets, um, do we then enter the actual time spent as opposed to like the Fibonacci number? Um, Actual times, well, yeah, so potentially different people will be touching a ticket. My, I like to go simple when I can. So if most people are touching a ticket, it doesn't actually affect the daily rate of that ticket, right? Because the developer's cost is fixed. So if a QA person touches it in the morning, or a developer touches it in the morning and QA touches it in the app, it's still the same money, right? I think. <laughs> what is it? Uh, we're using third party testing. Yeah, yep, that will be a different case. Yeah. You had one in the back? Yeah. Do you end up having to pull out the ones that have a ridiculously long cycle time for the tickets that are right. that, for lots of wait time? That's where the agile coach comes in and I'm like, just fix your process. You know, get the data right, use different charts, use uh, cycle time control charts to, to pay attention to those tickets and, and get your data right. So it's gonna take you six months to collect a history of data and to prove out some of these models, but after that, you should have a pretty tight understanding of what you're doing. Because you said that with some sorts of work, you end up with lots of wait time. Yep, yep. Any number of things could screw this up. <laughs> yep. Any more questions? No one's struggling with uh, Jira budgeting? But I will say that that does not stop a developer from putting in eight hours. <laughs> Is that it? All right. All right. Thanks. 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 program manager. Uh, I generally do coaching, uh, some Jira administration, but I have a great respect for the people that actually do the real back-end Jira administration, Confluence administration. So part of what I'm trying to get to here is helping you to help teams provide a single source of truth to provide information that's, that's necessary through the whole program uh, so that so that you can share how you did your plan, why you're working on certain, certain work, uh, and uh, how you got there. Not everyone here obviously is a Scrum Master, not everyone here is talking about this at that level, but you can go back to your, your groups and explain it in a similar terms if you think of it in terms of the, the modularization. <coughs> so, presumably each team or group has a space uh, and you, you should be using that parent-child relationship for those spaces. Uh, don't let people just go willy-nilly setting up spaces. If you allow your product team to use that, that parent-child relationship, you can keep your uh, uh, hierarchy pretty tight. Um, give, give your teams freedom, it's built, Confluence is built for freedom, but give them requirements. Um, make sure they understand that there are certain things that, that need to be in place for this to be usable. Um, uh, like templates for meetings, encourage that work. Because if you use templates for meetings, you can use this model that I'm gonna show you very easily. Um, and that's creating a page for each sprint. 
uh, sprint pages should be named properly. Uh, make sure that they, they follow whatever uh, sprint naming convention you use. Not everyone's using scaled agile, but if you are, for instance, you're going to name it uh, according to the PI, program increment, and then the sprint within that. Uh, or if it's just a series of numbers, if you're on sprint 742, make sure that you're talking about sp sprint 742 for that team. Um, you can uh, make each of these pages a child of the sprint page's home, which will be a child of your team's home. Uh, and that way people can find this information easily. You can use this uh, if you want to uh, do um, uh, excerpts. You can, you can build up from excerpts by using this model. Um, make sure that each of the pages are divided into categories of information, uh, which are, you'll see in a second, uh, are pretty standard for each planning session. Um, make it known that this is a work in progress, of course, until it isn't. Uh, if you're doing a planning process, the, the planning process will, will give you the information as, it, as it's available. If you're, if you're just planning the sprint, you don't have your retrospective yet because you're not done with that sprint. But this sprint page will include all of that information at the end. Uh, the goal here is uh, for synchronous as well as asynchronous communication. You want to, in, in your meeting, have it set up so it's clear what that meeting is, is meant to do, know what artifacts have to come out of that meeting, and provide them in, in that single source of truth. So, you can include the agenda, make it collapsible so it disappears after you don't need that anymore. Uh, same thing with velocity and capacity calculations, you can put them all right in that page. Make it collapsible if you want. Um, include sprint goals, make those visible because when you eventually want to present what your goals were and how you did against those goals, uh, you want to show uh, a certain uh, key to say done, in progress, not done. Um, you can use that dynamic linking for uh, attributing uh, to-do items, or a specific stories, or specific goals, or a specific demo to a specific person. Um, and make sure you link to the JIRA board and, and any reports that are necessary. So they have uh, one, like I said, single source of truth for that sprint. What's, in, what's interesting to anybody, whether it's a uh, CEO, uh, product owner, uh, QA, anybody on that one page, they can just go there. Um, again, and talk about demos. And then you can add a, a retro section on the page if you do a very simple wins, challenges, you know, how can we improve. Um, shout outs, those can all be on this page, or if you want to do much more in-depth retrospectives, just have it be a child on this page. So that the retrospective is directly linked to the work that you did for the planning. Uh, and then encourage adoption across the organization so that when people uh, go to look at these pages, it's pretty standard. They know what they're looking for. They can look on the page for that bit of information. They, it's not brand new each time they come to each one of these pages. Um, if everybody's if nobody's using these sprint pages, no one's going to understand why they would work. That one person who is is going to say, "I'm not the outlier. I swear this really works." And, <laughs> and, and once you get more adoption uh, from team to team, uh, it will show up more in uh, you know the, the demos. When you see three, four, five teams showing demos from this this sprint page, all of a sudden it's easier for everyone to understand why why it matters, why it works. Um, you can talk to other scrum masters, other team members. Uh, show your higher ups how it works. Uh, if if you if you think this can work, you know you can sometimes convince higher ups to say, hey, let's adopt this model. You can build a template and say, here's the template that I built. Uh, I think this will work, and then allow people to, to poke holes in it. Let them say, you know, that doesn't work for us, but if you add this, I'd like it. Um, Again, that, that consistency creates a safety net of process. So every, if everybody's going through and talking about what their goals are, then we know when they get to the demo, they're going to have to uh, address those goals. And, and we can speak in terms of process. We don't have to speak in terms of people. We can, we can let the process uh, get us past any difficult discussions because we say, this weird thing happened. You don't have to talk about who did it, but it's clear on this page why it happened. All the wins, same deal. The team, the team won, um, and again, as always, humans before technology, we want to make sure that people understand that they're a part of this. Oh, sorry. Let's go out to the actual page. So let's just pretend that this hangs off of my team page, Team Kubar. The um, sprint pages are all available here. This can go on for infinity. You can have it sort backwards if you want, so the most recent are at the top. But in essence, uh, let me just show you a blank one first. Before any, any information is in here, you know, I've got the I've got the team name. I've got the sprint clearly called out, uh, and here's the agenda for the meeting. And everybody knows going into each planning meeting what is required of everybody in the meeting. Uh, your sprint goals can be put in here after you do your planning session. Show how you broke down your capacity so that people understand why you decided to commit to that many stories. Um, Obviously, I, I could only link to myself in here. I'm not going to link to actual other Rosetta Stone employees. But let's just say I was doing all these things and I'm for myself. Uh, one of myself has three days off. Uh, one of myself has some spill. Account for each of those things. 
Uh, when you get into this sprint, you know what happened in the last sprint. Uh, and part of that can be part of your retrospective. Um, and then you can show in context everything that happened as you went along. Um, but let me show you how it works when you actually have some information in here. Uh, and also notice, you can create a handy dandy nav bar down here so people can bounce back and forth between the sprints. So again, you've got your agenda at the top. Everyone knows how the, how the meeting happens. We've got, this is for a completed planning, this is for a complete sprint, right? So, we went through everything that we needed to for our last sprint already. Uh, we talked about our capacity. Our capacity is broken out here. Here's our actual capacity that we're gonna to commit to. Um, and you, you counted for it here after the sprint. Uh, we got through 30 points, great. Um, here's the plan, I obviously obscured the actual stories, but you can take a snapshot of what your JIRA board looked like for that sprint, uh, what the actual sprint commit was. People can go and look at it. Um, and then you talked about your goals after you did your planning session. And here's how you presented it to, you, to the rest of the organization. Um, you know, we had some, some uh, features that worked out. Uh, this one got delayed because we had a, an environment problem. Uh, this one didn't work out because we had talked to legal about it. Um, but you have an, an example of, of, of what could block you. Uh, and all of it's called out here. Again, we don't have to attribute this to necessarily people, uh, unless you have an actual to-do item, or if you want to do a demo, for instance. Let the people know they're gonna be, a, you're gonna be doing a demo when you get to that actual demo session. And you can call that out again down here if you want. Um, here, we, we've got a retrospective right at the bottom of the page. We went through the sprint, it went well, uh, but as always, we need more QA, right? You can call out all these things and have, have the team participate and, and show them live what you're putting in here so that they're, you don't just look like you're kid, you know, typing away and typing away and it goes out into the ether. ether it's all available for them at the end of the uh, sprint retrospective. Um, yeah, I got a shout out here because uh, I, I evidently threw a great uh, cupcake party. So <laughs> congratulations to me, right? But um, another thing is you can attach anything you want. Just throw in the attachments macro here. That's how I added the screenshot here. But you can also attach all your demos directly to the page. People can go back and look at those videos if you have videos or PowerPoint, whatever you want to use. Um, so just for comparison, that's the completed one. We've got one that's not quite complete because we only did the planning session, but we did not yet get to the retrospective because the sprint's not over. So we've got some goals, no status yet. When we go through the, the sprint and we're done, we'll be able to report on that. That's pretty much everything I had. Any questions? Yeah. When you mentioned the parent-child relationship, are yep. you just talking about the page tree within a space? Yeah, within a space. Make sure people understand that, because this shouldn't be separate off of the ether, right? It should be directly connected to whatever team, whatever team is doing that retro. Yeah. Yeah. When you set up a team, how do you set up? So at being Scrum Master or Program Manager, it would generally be my responsibility at least to say, hey, do we have a volunteer to do this or I'm gonna do it for the team? Uh, you know, I'm in, in Scaled Agile, uh, it's, if there's a pretty you know, clear delineation of who's doing which work, um, but not every organization works that way. A lot of people wear different hats. You know, it, it should, <laughs> yeah. Another one actually. So, so when you make changes to this, like, yeah. uh, you get feedback and you get updates, yep. how does that propagate across all well, so uh, you're talking to the to the template, or I don't know. Actually, I'm just trying okay. to figure out because yeah. confluence is very loose. Yeah. So, I'm trying to it up. so the the way we tightened it up was just to have our scrum masters uh, and program managers, uh, project managers, and product owners all agree that this is a good format, and then to use this format going forward. And then we we meet weekly as scrum masters anyway, as PMO, uh, and we would say, hey, we we think we need to make a tweak to this template. Uh, we found this other, this one part's extraneous, we don't need to do that anymore. Instead, we started doing this. And that's exactly how we got to, that kind of conversation is exactly how we got to this idea, where people were making a list of all the tickets that are trying to copy and paste every single ticket there. But that just, I mean, I have a team here that's got, we're working literally 80 points of, of work in, in one sprint. There's no way that I can copy every single story and then have it, you know, be uh, expedient in, in the meeting. So I just literally took a screenshot. Um, and it, it saved us enough time that, you know, again, when it's not obscured, you can actually look at all the stories, you can see who they're assigned to, you can see the epics they're associated with, you can actually count up all the points, you can sort, sort so your, your bugs are not in there, you can include your bugs if you want. But this brings up all those topics because you're looking at these things together. Uh, for instance, do we have, does, does the team member have a, a time box for, for working on bugs? Uh, does that have to have an epic? Well, you can see it all comparatively when you do it this way. Yes, sir. 
uh, just wondering, like, some of the data that I saw there, because uh, I'm looking at it, I can't help it, but like, yeah. great opportunity to automatically pull some of that data. I'm wondering if you guys explored, if, if kind of explored like the velocity and, and some of the things that really are just sort of uh, available elsewhere, just need to figure out how to get it. So if it's, uh, uh, to, to be honest, in this case, what we're talking about are very manual calculations. Uh, and that is, that is actually by design because of the way at Rosetta Stone we currently account for stories. It could be dev complete, and that's really what the, the hierarchs care about. So we'll call it complete, and we have a separate JIRA board that calls it complete when it gets to ready for, uh, gets to uh, uh, testing complete. Might not be in production. Maybe there's an environment problem. We can't actually send it to production, so they can't actually close the story. But it's, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's closed. It's not blocked. It's just not marked as done in JIRA. So when you have those kinds of weirdnesses, you don't necessarily want to do all automated data. But I agree, it, it can be very useful in a, in a more standard uh, application of using JIRA. And part of it was getting conversations started about, are we all using the same processes? Do we all agree on what, what one point is? This is helping us to get to that. So, so in the sense, you sound like your position is like, if people want to know what's up with the spread. That's right. Okay. And, and to, prompt, to prompt those conversations so that eventually everyone can be using portfolio because we are standardizing our processes, because we are having that conversation about what one point means. Do you count bugs? That kind of thing. Any more questions? Nice job. Well, one more, one more, one more. <laughs> you feet. Um, I noticed you had like a to-do for yourself. Have yeah. you experimented with confluence tasks at all? Yeah, yeah, we, that, that works well. And some, some people liked them, some people didn't, so we didn't put them in this template, but sure. I, I like using tasks. Yeah. Any more questions? Nice job. <laughs> on the, uh, the bingo tonight, okay? So come say hi. Uh, but before we do that, first of all, Adaptivist is a fairly sizable company. We do some business, and we've got several products that are available on the marketplace. So, who can name one? Script runner? Who said that first? You. <laughs> come on, now, now last, if you were here last month, you might remember we, we had a product that started with a P, ended with Project something. <laughs> ah! Now, if we don't get your sizes right, you come see us afterwards and we'll hook you up. Uh, one more of that, so adapting this, we've got Script Runner. We also have Script Runner for Confluence, so I'm not going to count that one. Uh, Project Configurator. Has anyone heard about our testing product? Oh, 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 oh that, was, that was high and outside. Anybody else? One more, one more, before, we, before I hand it off to Will. No? Uh, oh, just, okay, fine. I'm just going to All right. So, tonight we have a great presentation for you with Will I Am Rojas presenting on initiatives and automation within Jira. Really excited. He's going to pre present you with some uh, fairly informative things. I have on good authority that they're fairly informative. So thanks everybody. Come say hi to us. We really want to, want to talk and enjoy yourselves tonight. Uh, William, take it away. Hey, how are you all doing? How are everybody doing tonight? Good, good. good. So we want to talk about initiatives and sort of initiatives that's like about the epic, basically. And then we'll, we'll talk a little about like where they position, what they are, and so forth. And then uh, some work that we've done with one of our clients to actually automate uh, the the work that goes around an initiative as you would work, because you know, we'll see when we get the presentation. Th there needs to be work on, on across a couple of tools, and that kind of raises a, a bit of a maintenance problem. So we'll talk a little about some of the, the automation. And uh, I may switch laptops. I have a demo I can try to show you. And then if it all goes well, we'll switch over. And then I'll show you a bit of a live demo of what we've done with them as well. OK? So what are initiatives in the first place? So initiatives are basically high-level pieces of work. Often, we just talked before, like often teams got to be a bunch of stories and so forth. But what, what came before the story? So hopefully, you, uh, especially large organizations, we have teams. Uh, business teams, product teams that are sort of looking at like the, the broader kind of bigger piece of the portfolio kind of further out, that's what the initiatives are for. That's what, so any new ideas that come into the company or the business from market or whatever the case, 
that's basically what we want to use the initiatives for. They, they try to sense what they, uh, what you want to use them for is like any, anything that new, new product or new features of a product, but big chunks of work. That's sort of the, the thing we want to remember about them. And they're trying to, uh, as we, as you look at the initiatives, like what they are trying to cover is either work across that eventually, we don't necessarily worry about that up front, but eventually may hit multiple projects, multiple containers within JIRA. They may hit multiple boards. They may ultimately go into multiple teams. But the idea of the, having the initiative like that up front is that initially you don't worry about that, right? You just basically, here's a big chunk of work that we need to do. What is this work all about? Who owns initiatives? Initiatives are, are best positioned in a product owner type role. So this is, we're talking PMO, uh, we're talking people that, that either, again, like where should my product be the next 12 months, the next 24 months? That's what we're looking for. And basically what you're looking for is that balance between what do I want to do from a business or marketplace? What do I need to do to satisfy customers? What kind of technologies do we need to look at? Where's the technology at? And that's basically what product managers are supposed to play. And initiatives are, are what we basically want to use to help them speak in their language, basically. So as I mentioned, initiatives is above an epic. That's how we want to kind of the best represent it. So one of the things important about this is that uh, we want to keep them within business context. And again, something, you know, if teams are delivering stories which are meant to be completed within a sprint, so, you know, at most two weeks with the work, epics are bigger than that, initiatives are even bigger than that. Uh, so one of, the things, one of the things I always tell clients is like, uh, we're, not, we're not solutioning, we're not trying to define things in terms of, I want this product to do this necessarily, but I want this kind of capability, I want this new idea, and then let the, the, the workflow of working through the initiatives take care of what epics and what stories eventually will be delivered. Why do we want these? Essentially what we're looking for is you want to, you want to be able to have consistency across how new ideas are, are worked through uh, the organization and eventually what you ultimately end up assigning to teams is something that uh, makes a lot of sense and has a lot of value and so forth. So basically we're trying to avoid stuff like this. Right? So somebody decided something, sent an email and said, yeah, that's fine. And then it comes to turn out like nobody vetted it out, nobody looked at it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So we probably how many of these, how many of you have ever kind of run across something like this before? <laughs> yeah. So I've seen my share. So let's talk a little about the funnel, right? So the, the one of the things that the, the, the what we want to try to do with this is just use use them to kind of work through that initial upfront funnel. So first of all, uh, we want to go from something that is a very fuzzy, maybe this, maybe that, we're not too sure, what would that look like, so forth, to a well-formed idea, something that's pretty concrete, has been bought in, uh, maybe there's some, some bias from some customer really wants it, and you have an understanding of what that would be, uh, etc. We talked about before this idea of pruning, right? So not all ideas are gonna be something you wanna ultimately pursue. So we need, a, we need the ability to say, kill that one, take that one off the queue, we're not gonna take that any further. So the, the funnel process should be such that you're, we're making, asking the right kinds of questions and doing the right type of assessment, saying is this something we should be pursuing? Is it worth it, you know, the return on this, not be worth the investment we're gonna get? If it isn't, kill it up front, right? Don't wait for your team to start working on it and then decide, hey, you know what, maybe it's not a good idea after all. Another thing that's very important about the initiatives is you want to have the ability to say, I have 100 ideas, I can deliver you know, four at a time, and when I'm ready to deliver those four, then yes, I'm ready to commit to that. Right? So this idea of kind of managing your work in progress, right? and, and, and it starts at the top. Right? So you don't want to have the teams working on 50 different things all at once because ultimately you're going to get a lot less out of those teams if that's how you want it to operate. So uh, the, the having that funnel and using something like initiative that are, are still in that assessment stage you're not ready to, to it says commit to, to roadmap uh, is very helpful. And then the other thing that's useful about this is that you want to create a, a way to separate my big ideas that the product managers are talking about and the architects and so forth are kind of vetting it out whether it's something we want to pursue or not and what the teams, the delivery teams are actually working on. So having separate places where you manage initiatives 
from where you manage your epics and your sprints and your stories that, that are going to sprints and teams are working on is also very helpful, very important. Okay? So, so we have like what are they and sort of what how they how the workflow we uh, works for them. So now let's talk a little about the like the, the general workflow of, of the initiative is basically gonna be upfront and, and let's just say regardless of what kind of methodology and workflow you're using, it's gonna kind of fall into this. So, so I don't so so we can kind of put a different specific process organization may have, what does viability mean for us in the three many stages of that potentially. But the idea here is up front, we're looking for like is this something that's viable and feasible for us to actually pursue? So therefore, things like what's my elevator pitch? What's, what's the value proposition? What's the business case? What um, kind of impacts do we have to the overall systems? That's all stuff that we want to kind of define up front. Uh, what are the first level order of estimates of this? You know, how, how big is this? Is this bigger than a bread box, smaller than a bread box? Uh, what type of priority, right? How important is this relative to what's already there? So give me an ability to prioritize some of this. Um, and then, therefore, we're now talking about some kind of backlog, and it's an initiative backlog. We're not ready for, for global level backlog. We want the ability to do this. So as you can see, tools like Jira and Confluence let you do this kind of stuff, right? So, so in a sense, I'm basically making the case where, where would you put this? Well, you can put some of the stuff in Jira, you can put some of the stuff in Confluence. So that's the viability. Then, then we're going to get into like what is the, the roadmap and plan that we want to do around this, right? So now that we've ready to commit, what do I want out of it? So I probably want some KPIs, I want to elaborate, right? So I want to probably probably look at some of those architectural impacts and then kind of vet them out before I'm ready to commit. I make sure that I have, we talked about before, like that, that you've done, uh, you've at least identified the needs, maybe maybe rework some stuff or stuff like that. You want to know that up front. Uh, what kind of impacts it's going to have to whatever we have already in flight. Uh, the ability to then break it down, you know, to like at the now now that I have my initiative ready to commit, I'm ready to now break it down into okay, this may be the kind of epics we're looking at, the kind of teams that we need to get involved, what type of milestones we're we looking at, so second order of estimation, right? So now estimate from initiative down to maybe an epic, and uh, looking at what kind of dependencies, prioritizing, and dealing with epics backlog. Then the next, the last stage of, of this kind of work that you want to run, this is sort of like delivery and tracking. So now we're ready for what often a lot of people work to is Jira 4, right? And we just kind of give epic to teams and have those teams work with sprints and stories and so forth. Uh, so we want to get them going, track, track the work. Uh, one of the things I'll show you is that sometimes teams want to like, okay, now that I'm ready to start the stuff, I have these 50 stories I want to always do, so give me the ability to kind of give me those 50 stories up front, hopefully we can create them by, by hand. There's some performer work that maybe we do. Uh, and obviously, again, more of the stuff that we, we typically see in, in typical projects want to work on sprints, track releases, more dependencies, more prioritization, uh, backlogs, the team have their own backups and so forth. So a, a good initiative workflow should let me accomplish those three things and there should be clear stages in which, yes, I'm doing the viability, now I'm road mapping, now I'm actually looking at the delivery. Okay, so as I said, I think what I was trying to do before, we have making a case for like, there's some work I need to do on the Jira side, there's some work I need to do on the Confluence side. And, and it's not one or the other, it's really both. Um, so this introduces a bit of a problem. And what we've been working with one of our, we did some work with one of our clients, is the, the, to be able to, in a sense, make that dual side somewhat seamless. So for example, one of the things that we worked on, and this is sort of the process that we created, uh, the ability to say, look, I have an initiative page in Confluence, and I kind of come up with some information, and at some point it's okay, yeah, this is good, I, I'm ready to commit to it, right? So it's a good idea. Uh, maybe I got an elevator pitch and somebody said, okay, tell me more. Now I want an issue in JIRA, so automatically create that issue for me, uh, make sure that the issue goes in the right place, make sure that uh, uh, this particular example we were working on, the team was, there we go, okay, so but the team was using a version to, to, to deliver that initiative, so we were creating versions for them. But ultimately, the, the main thing we're after is kind of creating an initiative in JIRA that will map to the page, the initiative page in Confluence, and make that automatic so that I didn't have to do it both, and then link them up so that you know this initiative is linked to this issue, et cetera. So I'll show you a little bit of that in the demo piece. And then another thing that we worked on with them is I said to mention those, those pro forma where at some time, a certain stage in, in, the, in the process, I'm ready to build up a bunch of my backlog. And, and again, some organizations may not apply everywhere, but some organizations sometimes say, I have these 
10 or 20 or however many stories that when I go into this stage, I would like my backlog to have that up front and then yeah, I'll, I'll tune up from there, but give me something to start with. Don't make me do it by hand. So as you may know, ScriptRunner is a great product for this kind of stuff. Whenever you have these kind of problems, ScriptRunner is what we say, hey, we can just do ScriptRunner. So that's basically what this project became. After we've kind of defined this is what we want to do, this is the kind of automation we want to have, then we, were, we came in with ScriptRunner on both Jira and Confluence to help orchestrate and automate some of this stuff. Okay? So let me, I'm going to switch over to laptop and I'll show you a little bit of a demo of what we have. Okay?